journey to the red sea part one of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain accordingly we set sail on the sixteenth of september eighteen eighteen our company consisted of mr beechey the doctor and myself two greek servants the miner and two boys from gournou whom we hired to take care of our luggage in the desert it so happened that we were to witness one of the greatest calamities that have occurred in egypt in the recollection of any one living the nile rose this season three feet and a half above the highest mark left by the former inundation with uncommon rapidity and carried off several villages and some hundreds of their inhabitants i never saw any picture that would give a more correct idea of a deluge than the valley of the nile in this season the arabs had expected an extraordinary inundation this year in consequence of the scarcity of water the preceding season but they did not apprehend it would rise to such a height they generally erect fences of earth and reeds around their villages to keep the water from their houses but the force of this inundation baffled all their efforts their cottages being built of earth could not stand one instant against the current and no sooner did the water reach them than it levelled them with the ground the rapid stream carried off all that was before it men women children cattle corn everything was washed away in an instant and left the place where the village stood without anything to indicate that there had ever been a house on the spot it is not the case as is generally supposed that all the villages of egypt are raised so high above the general level of the ground that the water cannot reach them on the contrary most of those in upper egypt are little if anything higher than the rest of the ground and the only way they have to keep off the water on the rise of the nile is by artificial fences made of earth and reeds it appeared to me to be in the midst of a vast lake containing various islands and magnificent edifices on our right we had the high rocks and the temples of gournou the memnonian the extensive buildings of medinet abu and the two colossal statues which rose out of the water like the lighthouses on some of the coasts of europe on our left we had the vast ruins of karnak and luxor to the east of which at a distance of eight miles ran the mokattam chain of mountains forming the boundaries of this vast lake as it appeared from our boat the first village we came to was agalta whither we went not merely to see the place but to desire the kanakin to send a soldier to guard the tombs in addition to the arabs and some of our people whom we had left there i thought this necessary notwithstanding the strong door i had caused to be made at its entrance he appeared immediately on our approaching the village and greatly lamented his situation as he expected to be washed away by the nile there was no boat in the village and should the water break down their weak fences the only chance of escape was by climbing the palm trees till providence sent some one to their relief all the boats were employed in carrying away the corn from villages that were in danger both in upper and lower egypt the men women and children are left to be the last assisted as their lives are not so valuable as corn which brings money to the bashaw as this village was then four feet below the water the poor fellows were on the watch day and night round their fences they employed their skin machines or bags to throw the water out again which rose from under the ground but if their fences should be broken down all was lost we offered to take the kamaikan with us in our boat but he could not quit the place which he was ordered to guard when we left this village there was but little wind so we did not proceed much farther and in the evening made fast our boat to some high ground between agalta and ermitz on the seventeenth we saw several villages in great danger of being destroyed the rapid stream had carried away the fences and their unfortunate inhabitants were obliged to escape to higher grounds where it was possible with what they could save from the water the distress of these people was great some of them had only a few feet of land and the water was to rise twelve days more and after that to remain twelve days at its height according to the usual term of the inundation 
fortunate was he who could reach a high ground some crossed the water on pieces of wood some on buffaloes or cows and others with reeds tied up in large bundles the small spots of high ground that stood above the water formed so many sanctuaries for these poor refugees and were crowded with people and beasts see plate twenty six the scanty stock of provision they could save was the only subsistence they could expect in some parts the water had left scarcely any dry ground and no relief could be hoped till four and twenty days had elapsed the kachefs and kamaikans of the country did all they could to assist the villages with their little boats but they were so small in proportion to what was wanted that they could not relieve the greater part of the unfortunate people it was distressing to behold these poor wretches in such a situation to approach them in our little boat would have been dangerous both to them and to us for so many would enter it at once that the boat would sink and we along with them to increase the number on our arrival at ermitz where fortunately the land is very high we found many of the neighbouring people collected we landed immediately and employed our boat to fetch the people from an opposite village the kamaikan set off himself with another boat and in the course of an hour he returned with several men and boys he sent the boats again and they returned loaded with men corn and cattle the third trip brought still more corn buffalo sheep goats asses and dogs i remarked that there were no women in that village but we were soon convinced of the regard paid to the fair sex in that country the fourth voyage was employed in fetching over the women as the last and most insignificant of their property whose loss would have been less regretted than that of the cattle i hope this circumstance will convince the european fair sex of our superiority over the turks and arabs at least in point of due respect to them these people say that women have no souls and indeed by the brutal manner in which they are treated we cannot expect such poor creatures to have any on the eighteenth we arrived in esne khalil bey was gone to cairo to take the command of the province of benesouf and ibrahim bey was now governor of esne he received us with uncommon civility and furnished us with a firman to the kachef who commanded the province of edfu on our return on board we found some bread greens and a sheep sent by the bay for which we returned a fine english gun and some powder at our desire he sent us a soldier to accompany us wherever we went but he gave strict orders that we should not take any of the emeralds from the mines for though he was the most civilized turk i ever knew he could not help supposing that we did not go into these deserts merely to see the mountains and the sand he imagined that if we came where the mines were we should naturally help ourselves to emeralds which he thought would be worthy our notice we set off on the next day and arrived at the island of huvesek before edfu it was rather late in the evening and on our approach to the fences which surrounded the village to keep off the water we alarmed the fellows so much that they all came to the spot where we were made us proceed up to a place where there was no danger of injuring the fence and kept strict watch over us all night they were certainly right for if our boat had struck against the fence it would have inevitably made a breach and of course inundated the village and the rest of the land on the twenty first in the morning we all went to the kachef who did what he could to procure us everything necessary he sent for the sheikh of the tribe that inhabited the deserts we had to pass his name was abada and he was a hostage for the security of the people that worked at the mines near the red sea we made our arrangements about the camels and drivers and found the terms very reasonable for we paid only one piaster a day for every camel and twenty paras for every man out of which they were to provide food both for themselves and their beasts it was agreed that we should keep the camels as long as we pleased and go wherever we thought proper we crossed part of the island with the boat as there were four feet water above the banks and went on shore on the east side of the main land 
on our arrival we met with mohammed aga the chief of the miners who had just arrived from the emerald mountains and was repairing to esne he seemed to be much concerned at our going thither and would fain have persuaded us to wait till he returned that he might accompany us as no one could go to the place without him we told him not to be alarmed for we were not in search of precious stones but of antiquities this did not appear to satisfy him and he said he would soon be back again we remained the rest of the day waiting until the drivers prepared bread for their journey in the morning of the twenty second there was no appearance of departure i had observed a sudden change in the sheikh since he saw the chief miner and began to suppose that his influence still prevailed on the sheikh to detain us at least as much as he could the miner himself had proposed that we should wait at the ruins of a temple about two days on our journey till his return to which proposal of course we did not agree i saw clearly he was not a little alarmed at our going for fear we should make some discovery among the minerals and all our assertions to the contrary had little effect we insisted on setting off that day and we did so the same evening our party was increased by the soldier from esne four camel drivers and a sheikh to guide us making in all twelve men we had sixteen camels six of which were laden with provisions water culinary utensils and so forth we halted at the foot of a hill three hours distance in the morning of the twenty third we set off very early and arrived at the first well in three hours here the camel drivers informed us that we could not advance till sheikh ibrahim joined us as he had to bring us more food for the camels we had been waiting the whole day with impatience but without seeing anybody the valley we entered afforded a good level road till we came to the foot of the mountain about fifteen miles from the nile we were seated under a dry sunt tree at a little distance from a small well hot winds that raised the sand blew the whole day several of the ababde came to water their cattle at the well but kept at a distance from us they live scattered about in the rocks and little valleys among the mountains but occasionally assemble together in a few minutes to pass this place without a good understanding with their sheikh for security would be imprudent and dangerous finding that the guide did not arrive in the evening we sent one of the drivers to the sheikh requesting him to send the man immediately otherwise if he were not with us at sunrise we should return and complain to the kachef at length on the next morning the twenty fourth he appeared and we set off pretty early the valley we now entered afforded a very level and good road there are in it several sunt and sycamore trees and in various places the thorny plant called basila represented in plate thirty six this is the plant on which the camels feed it is of a green colour at a certain season of the year i believe in the spring but it soon becomes dry and of course of a straw colour it bears a small fruit of the size of a pea but hollow inside the stalk is of a similar substance with that of rushes and it never grows higher than three feet as we advanced the valley became narrow and the trees thicker in some places but they gradually diminished and at last we entirely lost them on the right of the valley as we went up i observed the remains of a settlement which i considered as a station for the ancient caravans from the nile to berenice of which we afterwards found many others on the road placed at proper distances for the caravans to halt at night at some of them it is evident that there were wells of good water but they are now quite filled up advancing farther the mountains approach till the valley becomes little else than a wide road and after passing a narrow and high defile we entered an open plain here the mountains on the right run towards the south and after a long circuit return to form a valley with those on the left at the entrance of this valley stands a high rock on the left of which is a small egyptian temple to this we now directed our course and arrived at it six hours after setting off from the well in the morning on our approaching it we were not a little pleased at the sight it is of small magnitude as will be seen in plate twenty the plan of it is given in plate thirty three number three 
the portico which is built projecting from the rock has four columns two in front and two in the centre it is adorned with egyptian figures in intaglio reliviato and some retain their colour pretty well they are as large as life and not of the worst execution in the secos which is cut out of the rock are four pilasters at the end of it are three small chambers and there are two others one at each side in the corners of the lateral walls on which are to be seen figures and hieroglyphics in a pretty good style on one of the columns we observed a greek inscription which i did not copy as mr beechey took the trouble himself i made the drawing of the exterior view of the temple stone by stone the two front columns are joined to the sides of the portico by a wall nearly two-thirds of their height near the temple are the remains of an enclosure which no doubt was a station for the caravans but it is totally different from any other that we met with on that road as far as berenice it consists of a wall the form and extent of which may be seen in plate thirty three number four it was built by the greeks is twelve feet high and contained several houses within it for the accommodation of travellers in the centre was a well which is now filled up with sand all round the well there is a platform or gallery raised six feet high on which a guard of soldiers might walk all round on the upper part of the wall are holes for discharging arrows similar to those we see formed in our ancient buildings for the same purpose the sides of the gateways are built of calcareous stones and the wall is of bricks by this time i was convinced that this must have been a road to some place of consequence as it was obvious that there was a frequent passage of caravans this way the place is named wadi el mia the fort i think might have been built by some of the ptolemies to protect the caravans at the time when the trade with india by way of berenice and the red sea flourished at three o'clock in the morning of the twenty fifth we continued our journey no vegetation of any sort was to be seen anywhere sometimes we passed over wide and level plains and sometimes crossed rugged hills till two hours before sunset when we entered the valley called bizak by the arabs this valley runs from south to north and has several sunt trees scattered about in it and the usual thorn here we halted for the night and while our cook prepared our supper mr beechey and i went to see a granite rock at some distance as the abade had informed us that there was a magical stone there we entered the valley toward the north and observed that it must have been an ancient road as the usual marks of camel's feet were clearly impressed on the ground there is seldom any sand on these roads on the contrary they are covered with small pebbles and where the passage of camels was frequent they formed a strong impression which is to be seen to this day and may be traced to great length through these valleys till they reach the sandy country when we arrived at the rock we found it to be of fine granite in very large masses on one side of it are several figures cut on the stone which cannot be taken for any other than imitations of the egyptian they are meanly scrawled without shape or form but united with the circumstance of the camel's paths they are sufficient to indicate that the valley was a high road which by the direction it takes must have been that from coptos to berenice so well described by d'anville at this place mr ricci the doctor was attacked with a violent disorder and it was decided that he should return the next morning as it would increase if he advanced farther in the desert on the twenty sixth in the morning our caravan was divided into three different detachments we sent the luggage and provision on the way toward the east which we intended to take the doctor returned toward the nile on the west mr beechey and myself went in a south-east direction to see something that the abade had mentioned though we could not make out what they meant we entered a sandy valley with rocks on each side nearly perpendicular of white and calcareous grit stone with some veins of white marble intermixed after some hours march we reached a place named samont here we found the remains of an ancient settlement or station which appears by its situation to have been on the road from berenice to coptos 
it has several pieces of walls which are the only remains and evidently a well in the centre see plate thirty three number five the walls are built of rough stones without mortar we took the road to the east through several beautiful and romantic valleys if so they may be called the soil was sandy and stony but there are thorny plants to feed cattle and so many soot trees as to form a complete forest in some parts the rocks on each side are of diverse colours exhibiting the most beautiful and solitary scenes one who wishes to retire from the world might find a charming retreat in these wilds were it not for the want of water and all that is necessary to the subsistence of human life beside the intense heat of the sun which on calm days is so great in these valleys as to be almost insupportable advancing onward in three hours we reached a summit whence we saw at some distance what appeared to be the walls of a large and extensive town surrounded by high rocks as if by a fortification on our approach we saw it was an extensive sandy plain with several granite eminences the rocks rose at some distance from each other and appeared like so many little islands if the sand had been water i could not have distinguished this spot from the centre of the cataract i mean from above syene to the island of philo this place seemed to me as if it were passing the cataract with the difference only that i had a camel instead of a boat and the granite appeared to be of a finer quality than that of the cataract approaching to porphyry if the ancients did not make any use of it it was no doubt in consequence of the difficulty of conveying it to the nile from this place we travelled to the left toward the valley where it was intended we should halt our caravan had reached the place an hour before us though we proceeded very fast on our march here we found two wells one of salt water and the other quite putrid and brackish there are few waters in the world better than that of the nile and now to have to drink the worst was such a change in one day that we could not help feeling the consequences of it mr beechey was taken very ill from drinking at the first well and we had great apprehension of the next which was worse we had provision for a month but our fresh meat was gone and it was with difficulty we could procure a very lean goat the tribe of this country are all abade and extend from the confines of suez to the tribe of bijarine on the coast of the red sea below the latitude of twenty three degrees the manners of this race show them to be lovers of freedom they prefer living among the solitary rocks and deserts where they eat nothing but dura and drink water before submission to the command of any government on earth it is a great feast among them when they take the resolution of killing a lean goat but they eat it without fearing that any rapacious hands should take it from them a man of this stamp accustomed to liberty and independence would naturally find himself as in a prison if under the control of even the best of governments their greatest care is for their camels which are their support they breed them up to a certain growth and then send them to be exchanged for dura which constitutes their food the camels as well as other animals live upon the common thorn plant which is the most abundant to be found in the country some of the most industrious of the abade cut wood and make charcoal with it which they send to the nile on camels and barter it for dura tallow and tent cloth few however undergo such a labour for they like to live at their ease a pipe of tobacco is a luxury and a piece of a fat ram quite raw a great dainty they are all nearly naked badly made and of small stature they have fine eyes in particular the women as far as we could see of those that came to the wells the married women are covered the rest uncovered their head-dresses are very curious some are proud of having hair long enough to reach below their ears and there formed into curls which are so entangled that it would be impossible to pass a comb through them therefore the women never use such an instrument 
when they kill a sheep that has any fat which is very seldom they grease their heads all over and leave the fat in small pieces to be melted by the sun which makes them appear as if they had powder on their heads and this lasts for several days till the sun melts the whole and produces an exquisite odour for those who have a good nose as their hair is very crispy their heads remain dressed for a long time and that they may not derange their coiffure when their heads itch they have a piece of wood something like a packing needle with which they scratch themselves with great ease without disordering their headdress of which they are very proud their complexions are naturally of a dark chocolate their hair quite black their teeth fine and white protuberant and very large the spot where the well at which we halted is situated is an amphitheatre of rocks with trees in the centre in the winter all the scattered ababde in the mountains assemble themselves here and if any marriage takes place it is at this time it is always performed with due ceremony the lover first sends a camel to the father of the girl if this be accepted he applies personally to herself in the presence of one man as a witness if she consent the day of marriage is appointed before which the lover does not see his bride for seven days on the eighth she is presented to him in the tent of her father this day is celebrated by killing some of their lean sheep and by camel races the next day the happy couple retire to the tent of the bridegroom if the man becomes tired of his wife he sends her back with the same camel which she sent to her father as this is her own from the time of the marriage the mother of the bride must not speak a word to the bridegroom as long as she lives a regulation intended to prevent her from making mischief between the young couple and which might perhaps be adopted with advantage in some countries of europe it was now three years since they had had any rain whence there was a scarcity of thorns which was the cause as they said that their sheep were so meagre to make some arrangements for our proceeding and to purchase some sheep we were obliged to stop all this day at the well having contrived to boil a quantity of the water it became a little sweeter and we were told that the water of the next well was not so good as this the nile water we brought with us became bad two days after we had to put it into skins called hudri before taking leave of this place i shall give some farther account of the manners and customs of the people when a child is born the next day the father kills a sheep and gives the child a name when they are sick they say hula karim and lie down till they are better or till they die i saw old men that did not know or could not tell their age as they keep no account of such things but by appearance they must have been ninety years old when any one dies they dig a hole in the ground and put the corpse into it and very often on the spot where the person died and then remove their tents a little farther on they never intermarry with any but their own people a girl had been refused in marriage to a turkish kachef though she was as poor as any of her tribe the kachef attempted to use force and the consequence was that they assembled to the number of above three hundred and he prudently retired leaving his intended bride to be married to her cousin they have shown that they are sensible of their wild manner of living but continue in it for the sake of liberty for they wrote to the bay at esne that they were content to live in that wild state as all their forefathers had done to remain free from tyranny and despotism and that they would be quiet if they were left so but on the contrary they would sooner perish than lose their liberty some of these wild people as they are called came to the well in the course of the day and as they saw us quiet and peaceful they ventured at the persuasion of our drivers to approach us a few of them had been as far as the nile to purchase dura and these were accounted men of knowledge but the greater part had never quitted their mountains one of them seeing a piece of lemon peel lying on the ground wondered what it was and another who had been to the nile to show his great knowledge of things took it up and ate it with an air of self-sufficiency we gave them a piece of loaf sugar and when they had eaten it they declared that our valley must be better than their own as it produces such good and sweet bread 
when they buy dura they generally get it ground with the usual hand millstone in the village where they buy it and carry the flour into the desert their bread is baked under the ashes and is in the form of a large cake without leaven or salt their great enemies are the tribe of el masha and banuzi which dwell from between suez to the interior of arabia and the confines of syria with these tribes they had had many battles but it appeared that neither one or the other advanced beyond their old possessions they had also been at variance with the bejarines on the south but were now at peace with them all their arms are chiefly spears and swords or sabres of very old-fashioned narrow at the hilt and broad at the point they have very few firearms and those they have are with matchlocks their constant hard way of life made them accustomed to eat raw meat and to suffer the inconveniences of a desert with the greatest indifference i have seen them for near four and twenty hours without drinking and walking the whole day and night in the hottest season they are not so religious as the arabs of the nile i scarcely ever saw them saying their prayers by the great caution i observed in our guide as we advanced in the desert i perceived it was necessary that he should acquaint them of the protection we had from their sheikh by whose permission we ventured among them thus alone and without any escort it appeared to me that they were much exasperated toward the soldiers who had lately been sent into their mountains in search of emeralds and had it not been for the danger of their sheikh whose property and life were in the hands of the turks they would soon have turned these people out of the mountains particularly as the miners were a set of desperate fellows who behaved very ill often assailed their tents committed depredations and insulted their women of which the abates complained very much on the twenty eighth early in the morning we set off and passed through many rocky valleys the road was not quite so level as before but good enough for any horse to trot along there was nothing interesting except large plains of sand and high mountains before us we arrived in the evening at a spot named gurf on the twenty ninth we traversed several pleasing valleys the mountains that surround them were all of hard stones and beautifully variegated with different coloured marble about two in the afternoon we saw the red sea at a great distance and having entered a range of mountains stopped at a place called owel or place of the dragon end of number nineteen first journey part five of narrative of the operations and recent discoveries in egypt and nubia by giovanni belzoni this librivox recording is in the public domain first journey part five proceeding on our voyage we passed taffa and entered the rocks of granite above that place here the nile seems as if a passage had been cut for it through a chain of high mountains which rise nearly perpendicular on each side of the river and open gradually to the south into another country as we advanced forward the view extended more and more on the right of the nile were several groups of palm trees on the left the distant ruins of Kalabza and in the centre the island of the same name which has a formidable appearance at a distance owing to the ruins of some saracenic houses which give it the resemblance of a castle we arrived at this island the same evening twenty ninth this day we arrived at a village named el kalabsi at the foot of a rock and facing the river stand the ruins of a temple which certainly must have been of later date than any other in nubia for it appeared to me to have been thrown down by violence as i did not see that decay in its materials which i have observed in other edifices and 